All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today uh, for a nice journey into the wonderful world of esports and gaming. A uh, quick disclaimer uh, before we start. So you see the Webedia logo here. This is not a commercial pitch for Webedia. Um, it's, it's just the intro, intro slide. Uh, just one quick word about us, uh, and I promise it will be the only time. Uh, one quick word about Webedia Arabia. So Webedia Arabia, we are, uh, we are one of the largest um, digital network uh, in the Arab world, reaching out to uh, over than 50 million uh, people. Um, and our vision is to reach out to people through passion points, passion topics. Uh, one of them today will obviously is obviously esports and gaming, but we also uh, talk about fashion and beauty, pop culture, food, parenting. Um, to create uh, content around passionate topics, you need passionate people. So let me introduce you to your crew for today. Um, so yours truly, I'm Edouard, I'm French. Um, I've launched uh, this business unit for Webidi Arabia two years ago. I have 10 years in Dubai. Uh, although this venture is quite new, uh, it, uh, after two years, uh, we can rely on our international network of Webedia, our mother company Webedia, which has been a key player in the world of gaming and esports for the past 10 years. And these experts that we can reach from uh, Europe, uh, the South Africa, North America, uh, are helping us uh, in our day-to-day -day business. Uh, second, we have Joe, who's leading our uh, commercial uh, strategy uh, and commercial efforts. Um, so Joe is not only part of the team, but probably even more interesting. Joe is the proud owner of uh, one of the most uh, prominent teams, esports team in the region, Divine Vendetta. Uh, and so he has lots of insider news from the uh, esports community. And last but not least, thank you very much uh, to Luai for joining us. Uh, so Luai is the brand communications director for Mobile. Uh, we had the pleasure to work with Mobile in their, in their first journey into the, the world of gaming and esports. Uh, and Luai will give us a live testimony of uh, this first experience uh, towards the end of this presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll open the floor for Q&A. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to use the tool, the top button on the presentation to uh, ask your questions and we make sure to answer them. So let's go into the meat of things. Um, so today is about gaming and esports. Uh, there was a lot of noise lately because of the COVID and lockdown situation that gaming and esports are exploding. Um, to put things in perspective, uh, yes, this, the phenomenon is accelerating, but it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It's a reality that has been existing for a few years. And to give you a sheer, an understanding of the sheer size of this phenomenon, uh, some very telling numbers. Um, 51 billion is the numbers of hours, total hours watched on, on Netflix in 2018. So in the entire world, 51 billion of hours of content have been watched on Netflix in 2018. During the same period of time, 50 billion hours of gaming content have been watched on YouTube only. Uh, so, you know, this, this gives you an idea of the size of YouTube, obviously, but gaming content only, on YouTube only, when you think there are, you have other platforms, this is, it's a, it's a mind-boggling number. Uh, if you go, so this is from a conception, a content conception perspective. If you go into the market size perspective, the, the size of the music industry is $17 billion. The size of the gaming industry total is 148. Uh, and this is actually a number for 2019, not 18. Uh, so roughly 10 times the size, 10 times the size of the music industry. Again, this is, it's a number which is difficult to grasp or to understand. Uh, one of the best way to understand probably is to look at the viewership uh, of esports events. So in 2018, the final of League of Legends uh, was followed by 200 million viewers. Uh, League of Legends is one of the most prominent games when it comes to esports. Uh, very popular in Asia and growing at, uh, in every country in the world. At the same time, the final of the Champions League, football, uh, was watched by 180 million viewers. So technically, esports is already bigger than football. Uh, this is a nice claim to make. 
uh, you'll see that it's, uh, it's, it's probably an early claim to make, but yes, it's happening. And really to, to understand this, I, if, if you're very curious about the topic, I would highly recommend you, when you have the opportunity to attend an event, attend a game conference, attend a tournament, even if you don't understand the, the, the game itself, but you'll, you'll be able to witness the sheer level of passion, of commitment, the quality of the production of these events to realize that this is already the real deal. Um, so these are numbers, you know, international level. If we focus on the local market, uh, the numbers I'm sharing here are coming from New Zoo, which is the leading research company when it comes to gaming in the world. So we're partnering with them. Uh, you know, esports gaming is really led by data. Uh, so we make sure that we work, when we work with partners, we provide them with the best and latest insights. Hence, we partnered with New Zoo. Uh, so at the local level, MENA is one of the fastest growing markets uh, in, uh, in the world, the, the fastest growing one. Uh, it's been growing more than double digits uh, in the past uh, five to six years, um, and it continues to grow. If we look at two of our key markets, uh, Saudi and UAE. So Saudi has 20 million gamers, UAE has 6 million gamers, and they rank respectively 24th and 48th in terms of size number of players. When you look at their weight in terms of revenues in the gaming industry, uh, they're higher than this. What does it tell us? It says that the purchasing power of gamers, of Saudi gamers, you know, is, is, is high, is very high, and it's actually higher than in other countries. Uh, a telling example, Saudi is the country where we have the most, uh, what we call whales in, in, uh, the, in the gaming jargon. And what's, what is a whale? A whale is a guy that can spend a couple thousand, a few thousand dollars a month in uh, these add-ons you can get into games. So, you know, a dance in Fortnite, an outfit, uh, additional diamonds in, uh, in, uh, uh, in these mobile games that you, you, you play casually. Uh, Saudi is famous for this. Saudi is famous for this. And it's a very interesting market for the game publishers. So what does it mean? It means that this market that was for a long time uh, you know, handled as a, as a part of the EAMEA business of a publisher is now looked at a region per se. And we see some of the biggest game publishers, so the people who create the game, uh, opening their headquarters here in Dubai to deal uh, GCC as uh, one specific region. Uh, this, for brands, for people who are in interested in partnering with game publishers, means more opportunity for content, for tournament, uh, for, uh, for any kind of partnerships with the game that's themselves. If you move now into the effect of the coronavirus. So we've been reading everywhere, coronavirus is making the, the gaming uh, explode everywhere. Esports is the biggest thing. So it was big already, but yes, the impact locally is significant. So the data, the latest data is scarce. So what we did is we looked at our own properties. So Talent Web, Talent Web Arabia is our multi-channel network on YouTube, uh, which is made of 13 of the biggest gaming influencers in the region. And what we saw is a 50% year-on-year increase uh, when once the lockdown started. So in the months of uh, mid-March, from mid-March to mid-April, 50% increase in views on YouTube from our MCN, multi, uh, uh, MCN Talent Web Arabia. Likewise, in our publication, Saudi Gamer, which is uh, the leading uh, gaming publication in, the, in, the, in Saudi Arabia, we've seen an increase of 52% uh, page views week on week from the moment the lockdown was announced. Uh, if we look, now we have a bit, uh, a bit more uh, time to look at things. After a month of lockdown, the increase is actually of 60% versus the month of Feb. So yes, the effect in terms of consumption, at least, is significant. Uh, the effect in terms of number of players is, is not there. The data is not there available, but, but this gives us a very good insight uh, from our own analytics on the impact of the coronavirus. So we've talked a lot about, you know, audience, who are these people? So yes, who these people are, it won't surprise you. They are millennials, they are Gen Z, uh, they are young people. They are, it's, in, in Saudi specifically, it's 70% male. So you still have a significant 30% women with, uh, who, are, who are playing. Um, 
68% of them are below 35 year old. Uh, and actually the remaining are Gen X or lower end of Gen X, so up to 40, 45 year old. And this gives you uh, uh, almost the entire gaming population. It's obviously a very or a hyper connected population, uh, more than 28 hours a week uh, spent on connected device. Uh, and obviously sometimes way more just spending uh, this time gaming. Uh, so these numbers in terms of attention are, are very impressive. One thing very important to notice, and this is probably one of the first uh, takeaway we will want you to have for today, is that there is no such thing as a community or a single community of gamer. Okay, you have the gaming world is a sum of communities. Uh, these communities are built around devices on which they play, whether it's PC, mobile, or a PlayStation, for example, on the games they play themselves, on the people they follow. Uh, but when you want to address gamers, you should imagine that you're addressing a specific community within the, within the, the gaming world. Uh, and this is essential for you to carry uh, an efficient message. So to, to, to give an analogy into sports, uh, you know, a football fan is not the same as a tennis fan. It's the same when it comes to gaming. So because of this, uh, these gamers are scattered around very different platforms. So you're very familiar with some of them. Uh, you've certainly heard about Twitch, maybe not or not so much about Discord, uh, which is, uh, to put it in simple words, sort of a slack for gamers where uh, you do back office for tournaments. Uh, so these guys gathers on this different platform depending on the content they want to consume. Uh, there's a very important factor here, which is live. So the, the live broadcast aspect is essential when it comes to gaming. Uh, and it's probably one of the reasons that made the market explode in the latest years. Uh, so the, the key player here is Twitch, uh, but YouTube Live is, uh, is, very, is still very important in the region. Facebook is investing heavily and some games are typically very prominent on Facebook Live, uh, and I don't mention all the others. Um, so this being said, you have many different platforms and you have many different content creators. Um, so you've heard about, you know, this word is everywhere right now, streaming. So yes, the streamers are a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, what's a streamer? It's a guy who's broadcasting live on Twitch, on YouTube Live, on Facebook Live, uh, his gameplay, and he's um, discussing or engaging live with his own community. You probably heard about Ninja, who's the most famous streamer in the world. Uh, we see in the region uh, an, a huge growth of the number of streamers. Then you have the esports gamers. So these guys are uh, the equivalent, you know, of your idol in sports. So these guys are worshipped, idolized, uh, followed by uh, the gamers of a specific game. And they create content around about their daily life, about their tournament play and so on. Then you have the caster, which is the equivalent of a commentator uh, in sports. And last but not least, uh, the casual gamer. So it's, uh, it's uh, you and I or these influencers, the guy who plays casual game, any type of game, and not necessarily esport game, uh, who creates video about uh, you know, his gameplay, tricks, uh, solutions, uh, analysis of a game, and so on. And they publish it on the more traditional networks, uh, per se. Um, but again, if you want to uh, address the full scope, you have to be mindful of all these different platforms. So this leads us to an essential slide here is understanding the gaming and esports ecosystem and its value chain. So where, where are these very valuable audience? So of course, first they play, okay? They are, they are on the games. So the game publishers, uh, I mentioned here a few, it would be EA Sports for FIFA, the people who edit and create the game. Then the audience also follows their pro or esports teams uh, that they're a fan of. Uh, then they watch or play and engage with tournaments. So these tournaments can be offline, as I, I showed at the beginning, but mostly online. Uh, then you have the talents or the influencers who create content uh, on YouTube, Facebook, and so on. And last, uh, the media, which gives you all the latest uh, news and info you need to have on game, uh, game releases, patch, uh, tricks, and so on. So these are the four touch points, uh, five touch points, that any brand who wants to enter the game uh, need to have in mind uh, to understand how uh, any activation would work.
Um, so this leads us now to uh, probably the meat of the presentation, which is how do brands can engage uh, in, in, with the gamers? So I leave the floor now to Joe. Uh, let me just pass him my... Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edward, for, for the quick, uh, for the interesting and the good introduction about how, um, how actually from a data standpoint, how the market is growing. And obviously, uh, when the market grows, the demand of the content becomes really higher. And when the demand becomes higher, then you see brands stepping into this environment, obviously, to tap into the world of gaming and esports. But before going into that, it's really interesting that a lot of people who are not really particularly, um, uh, they are prominent within the space, so similar to Elon Musk, for example, who just recently said, you know, okay, esports will soon become the most popular sport in the world. And He's an interesting uh, controversial figure with controversial statements quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of times. But it's interesting also to see how people who are outside the industry are looking at the industry. And that's mainly how, how we believe this, this whole thing will be uh, eventually moving forward. It's really, it's really important to understand. Maybe, maybe some of you understand that, but some of you maybe sometimes feel the, the challenge of, okay, what is the difference between a gamer and an esports or gaming and esports? Well, it's very simple. If you play games, if you practice playing video games, you are a gamer. It's as simple as that. Whereas obviously when it comes to esports, it's re it really stands for the competitive practice of actually playing video games, doing it alone in a team, online, in a competition, in a physical venue, really kind of doing it for, for the, not only for the, for the passion, but for the competitive level of trying to be the best. So really two simple ways to define it as we move forward accordingly, obviously, to that. There's a lot of money being invested in esports and gaming right now. We're talking about $1 billion already being invested by brands in esports uh, and expecting it to double around in 2022. And you see a lot of brands who are going into the space really not very direct when it comes to a gaming brands, similar to what you see here on the slide, Volvic and Shell. Uh, brands who are not really directly involved with the gamers when it comes to the product itself, but nonetheless, they see the opportunity. What we will be able to show you right now is a bunch of uh, examples where brands have taken the step of going into the gaming space with the content that they have created and why have they done that? We'll start with uh, Mercedes. You know, whenever we talk about Mercedes, most of, the, most of the perception goes to, it's really my dad's car. Well, not anymore. Uh. As you get older, life becomes all about following a few simple rules. Dress proper. Get a real job. Spend time with family. Dance to the beat of your own drum. Work hard. Get married. Move to the suburbs. Start a family. Be humble. interesting piece uh, on how to change a brand perception, obviously. Uh, apologies if the video will have difficulties to play. Sadly, sometimes these kind of platforms uh, are a little bit crude when it comes to these kind of things. Another piece, uh, and, and here for the gamers who understand that there is a rivalry that happens in the world between Europe and North America. So obviously, whenever there's an esports competition that happens throughout the world, there's always this huge debate that happens online that is EU better than North America? or North America is better than EU. In this case, Lion Serial took a stand, and that's actually what they did. Yeah. 
ça, c'est un fan d'e-sport qu'a le Lyon Style. You won't, you won't understand this unless you're a gamer. And I think that's the power of this piece is that they really target the people who actually understand this rivalry that happens between the two crowds. We have some brands like Axe. And you know what the Axe brand is all about. It's about you know, having your mojo and being able to uh, be seductive. They have found their way within the space while understanding also as well that, you know what, gamers do have their own mojo and with a series of interesting content, they ask them to make their move. Oh, <gasps> ball sticks. Sucks for Jen. Maybe she needs cheering up. Uh, maybe. Watch this. Seriously? Another uh, quick one oh. from... So it's our six month anniversary today. Got you these. I'm pollen intolerant. I've told you so many times. Wow, a bloodthirster. I know you love to life steal. You know, obviously uh, the cues in the content here is very interesting. It's about the sword that is available in League of Legends and the word life steal, which is a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a power technique for the item that players purchase within League of Legends. So the, the wording and the, the scripting when it comes to these kind of content has to be done by gamers at heart or else it will become a little bit irrelevant. So it's our six month anniversary. My name is Chris. And we, we, will move to, we will move now to a piece uh, with KFC uh, where eventually they wanted to decide that what's a perfect gamer and they wanted to define it from their own point of view and they think that they have cracked that. My name is Chris. And through eating the KFC vegan burger, I became the perfect gamer. The first thing that I noticed was how much more energy I had. More energy meant that beating my friends was no longer an issue. It's hilarious because uh, I'm playing with my foot right now. You better get good, kid. He said he wants a rematch. <laughs> so I moved on to beating them two, three, four at a time. But it was all still too easy. Would you like I go on mine? Psych! <laughs> Sometimes a different perspective is interesting. Back to the lobby for you, kid. Oh, uh, uh, do you want any more egg on your face? I'd love it, but I'm vegan now. <laughs> My reactions were so fast that I was playing Wii tennis and table tennis at the same time. I was reacting to things I couldn't even see. I call it vegan vision. Vegan vision. I should really copyright that, shouldn't I? I heard somewhere that Roman gladiators were plant-based, which kind of makes sense. And kind of the closest thing there is to a modern day gladiator. Switching to a vegan burger diet has not only made me a better competitor, as we all know, Switching to a vegan burger diet makes you a better athlete. Hang on, are you playing a game right now? Mm-hmm. And I'm winning. Standard. Is this guy serious? Interesting way to look how they actually took how to promote the vegan burger. A very interesting put. Uh, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but obviously they have taken the, the leap forward in that space. Um, I mean, we've all probably heard about this one and it really melted some faces by actually asking the question of how come a brand like Louis Vuitton be able to enter the gaming space? A brand that is really about premium luxury, but you know, this is how brands, when they define expectations and they really take a leap forward into, uh, into any segment or any industry, that's how they have done this, by creating a very interesting new lineup of clothing in the game and outside the game.
obviously by creating these kind of uh, lines outside the game and also some skins for League of Legends to really uh, reinforce the partnership that they had, they really done the job in an excellent way. One of the brands that really kind of created a little bit of um, exclamation marks going into the space was a brand like Shell. Uh, a brand that is really in the, in the energy field, uh, doesn't really, is not really reliable on the consumers uh, or the young consumers at specific, but they have taken that step forward because they understand that they can change a perception. Apologies, this ad is in German, but what you will see here is a character that is mimicking, uh, a cast that is mimicking an in-game character. Punkte boosten. Jungs, ich hab aufgetankt. Shell Club Smart Mitglied werden und Punkte für League of Legends Prämien sammeln. Obviously, the character was obviously dressed in a League of Legends character and they were promoting the partnership that they have created with the, with the, with the publisher. We move to another interesting piece, which is from Samsung. And uh, this is a very interesting piece simply because they have integrated uh, their brand within the product and how it influenced the whole community around a popular game like Fortnite. They got skin in the game and Samsung really did it really well. How do you turn a phone known for this? I can draw and take notes. Into the phone for gaming. Samsung Galaxy Note 9 is the one that everyone's talking about. You don't make a campaign, you make a character and drop it into the world's biggest game. Introducing the Galaxy Skin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Galaxy Skin. The most hyped skin in Fortnite right the now. The rarest skin ever. The only way to unlock it is to purchase the Galaxy Note 9. To build hype, we gave the skin to one gamer before anyone else. Ninja. 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 What? The world's biggest gamer unboxed the Note 9 in front of 20 million viewers. And then he jumped on Twitch and dominated with the Galaxy skin live. This is the best skin in the game, facts. Gamers lost their s***. What? Dude, that looks so effing cool. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, Galaxy skin! They had to have the Galaxy skin even if it meant attempting to download it from demo phones in retail stores. I am at the mall and I'm going to be attempting to go and get the skin. It's loading, boys. Come all this way to get a Galaxy skin. We just wasted two hours in and get the skin. Gamers shared their fails on Reddit. And a secondary market opened up. Yeah, that's $7,000 for a skin that came free on a $900 phone. The Galaxy skin went beyond the game. Fans made action figures, fashion lines, and even makeup tutorials. Gamers couldn't stop talking about Galaxy. But most importantly, we saw an increase in Galaxy Note 9 sales of 243% and got fans of our competitors in store and hands on with a Note 9. That's how you turn a phone for productivity geeks into the phone for gamers. Very interesting and very successful because this is the pinnacle of what a brand should do when it comes to the gaming space. Using the right attributes when it comes to the product, also to the talent that they have chosen, up to the word of mouth that they have created for the demand of the skin and the phone itself. Speaking of Fortnite, sometimes you have the right to work with Fortnite and sometimes you don't. And you know, in the case of Wendy's, they really don't do frozen burgers and that's how. Let's now talk Fortnite, shall we? It's the newest video game craze spreading fast among kids, college kids, even celebrities. Kids are nuts for this Fortnite. Fortnite has taken over the gaming world, becoming the most streamed game on Twitch ever. But brands are left out of the action, either tweeting from the sidelines or paying big bucks for in-game sponsorships. So when Fortnite announced a new event called Food Fight between Team Pizza and Team Burger, Wendy saw an organic way in. We found out Team Burger stored their beef in freezers. And Wendy's doesn't do frozen beef. So we got on Twitch, chose a character with red hair and pigtails, 
dropped into the game, and instead of killing other players, we started destroying burger freezers. Again, and again, and again, for nine hours straight. We also declared our mission on Twitter, sending hundreds of thousands of gamers to Twitch to watch us play. And soon other players stopped killing each other and started killing burger freezers with us. Hey, Wendy's, dude, let's go! Top Twitch streamers took notice. I saw a Wendy stream over here, dude. Oh, you smacking the Derbers freezers? This shit's lit. Uh, this kind of stuff keeps the game fresh. Thank you so much for coming to the stream, Wendy. News outlets were talking about it. Even Twitch posted a highlight reel of Wendy's best freezer kills. Then, our own competitors showed us some respect. But most importantly, the game developers removed the freezers from every burger restaurant, meaning Wendy's had rid Fortnite of frozen beef forever. This is when you have a, uh, a creative director who is really a gamer at heart and there's a true insight coming from the game to do really great work. This was a can winner. We move to the next piece uh, on, uh, with Coca-Cola. Look, you know, sometimes there's a lot, always the fact of doing great ideas and coming up with these creative twists. But by the end of the day, players just, they want to play. And this is what Coke did. One of the pieces that we have done globally with Coke uh, in, with our France offices. Sometimes you don't have to really uh, go very, uh, you can go very operational. It's okay not to be very creative. It's okay to be the catalyst. It's okay and absolutely fine to just let players play games. And that's a great success story from Coke. Uh, just as a small reminder, if you want to have any questions, please type it in the Q&A. We will get back to all the questions, obviously, after we finish the presentation. Thank you. Now we move to, uh, oh, it's freezing on me a little bit, one second. Okay. You know, we, we talked a lot about some global examples. And this is a, 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 a local example that we have worked with Pringles. And obviously they have tasked us to enter the gaming space, but you know, we gave them the solution of, you know what, PUBG Mobile is a, game, is a game that is really rising. And if we need to do something, let's do it with the right people and let's speak the same language. Or you know what, let's do it in the game. 
And this is the piece that we have created. Ya shabab! It's ready to fuzz up 20,000 dollars. My friend is from Sabaka, PUBG Mobile. Hey, fi khair is from Shinki. Simple, effective, and straight to the point. We spoke the language of what the PUBG community, uh, PUBG Mobile community speaks using one of the talents. This guy is called UAE Skills. He's very prominent within the community of PUBG Mobile. And the entourage and the art direction and the look and feel of the whole campaign was really embedded within the style of what the PUBG Mobile universe looks like. So if you really want to speak to gamers, let's speak to gamers within their own turf and territory. We move now to uh, an interesting piece from Vodafone where, you know, there's this big talk, who's a gamer? Uh, am I a gamer? Do I play, if I played one game, am I a gamer? Or if I play five games, am I, if I, am I a gamer? So Vodafone obviously took that point and really wanted to establish a point of view on the matter. And this is what they've done. Gamer, 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 gamer. And she's a gamer. And her, this lot too, and them. And her, and this guy, yep, and them, these guys too. And her! Yep, gamer. It's simple. You want to promote 5G, promote it to all gamers. And guess what? Everyone is a gamer. We end this with a very special dear piece to us, uh, which we take a lot of pride in creating. Um, in Saudi, there's a lot of unsung heroes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of players who have achieved greatness when it comes to gaming and esports. And they are not known. No one has ever probably heard of them. Some people have, but probably the mass community or the mass audience didn't really pay attention to the amount of efforts that these guys have done. Mobile wanted to approach gaming and luckily for us, they have chosen the right strategy and they have created a great piece of content with us that is really not only building on that space, but also building on their brand. بس مع كلام كثير عن الجيمرز انهم جيكس وانهم ما عندهم حياة بس يقدرون على الكمبيوتر وما يسوون شيء. بعض الناس مو فاهم الاسبورت مو فاهم انه هو المستقبل للرياضات. في ناس كثير هم يشوفوا انه الجيم مضيع للوقت. بالعكس هذه وظيفه اكثر من انك انت كلاعب. الاسبورت تغير عن حياه ناس كثير. حاب ابين لهم ان هذا هو المستقبل. انت يمكن لو لو تخش جو الجيمنج عالم الجيمنج بس ابو ساعتين بس ثلاث ساعات صدقني ما راح توقف احب الادرينالين والرش اللي يجيني. هي مثل اي رياضه ثانيه. الإسبورت يبغى له تركيز يبغى لها سرعة الانتباه في اللعبة. الإسبورت في السعودية أنا أشوفها هذه بداية وبداية مرة قوية. كل ما أدخل على بطولة في الإسبورت أعتبرها آخر بطولة في حياتي. عالم السعودية لما شفته يترفع اسمي كله كان يرجف. لا تخلي الفشل هو حاجز لك لأن الفشل هو بداية النجاح. اسمي خالفة. أنا سورة اسمي كسار أنا فاست أنا اللي مستقبل السبورت إنه صار جزء مني ومن شخصيتي وما أتوقع إنه يجي اليوم اللي أقدر أتركه Obviously Mobile didn't stop by this piece they've created a series of stories about each and every single of those champions and eventually turned to okay. I found this on the web for Hey series of stories about. That's, Check it out. That's my Siri actually, just answering my question. Sorry about that. So eventually, speaking of Mobile right now, what we will do is let's speak to the man himself, uh, Luai, about why they have taken that step and why they have, uh, they have eventually approached gaming and esports the way that they have done and what are the plans that they have for the future, obviously. So, uh, welcoming Luai, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you guys for the opportunity and for us to actually talk about this. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I just really, before going into a lot of details, just explain to us what was the thought process, what you guys uh, acquired when it comes to how to tackle this subject. Uh, from, from obviously you've heard about gaming and esports for quite some time. What was the tipping point that made uh, Mobile go into the space? Uh, well, I mean, uh, if you want to consider the whole timeline of how this operation all started, uh, it basically started from looking at the phenomena that started to materialize in Saudi Arabia in terms of us having, um, uh, Masad was uh, one of the first uh, Saudis to actually be crowned in the FIFA World Cup. Ironically, we lost that uh, FIFA World Cup, but we won it electronically. And suddenly people started incorporating the conversation of how Saudi lost the World Cup, but won the World Cup at the same time. Uh, and then it started becoming more and more and to a lot of circles as an idea of, is this an opportunity to create content? Or is this an, uh, an opportunity to, to cross sell? Is it a platform? So it started with an experiment. And uh, one of the key uh, elements of this experiment is knowing who are you partnering with? Uh, who is going to be your partner and actually guiding you into this new territory? Because we knew that we had the intent of pushing forward when it comes to uh, uh, this niche and how we want to expand on it. But we wanted to know how to be relevant as well, because uh, as you might know, and some of the audiences are for gamers, it's a heavily uh, uh, enclosed community. So if you're not relevant, if you're not clicking with the, uh, with the audience, there is no way you're going to make it. Uh, they can see you, they can see through you. So if you're not coming from a genuine place, uh, it's not going to happen. And if it wasn't for the passion of the team involved being gamers themselves, uh, it, it wouldn't have been able uh, to materialize at least to understand where the opportunity lies. Uh, of course, it was a small uh, experiment uh, at first, but it started to grow exponentially uh, based on the kind of engagement we're expecting. If it's something that is investment but high impact, suddenly it starts to equalize and you start to see more and more opportunities pop up. And uh, one of the key things that I think uh, us working together and you guys noticed is that all of this happened right before the government started to adopt heavy esports strategies. So we, we were ahead of the curve when it comes to that. And now we're trying to be, uh, or we're trying to cut uh, a small piece of ours, uh, I mean, of this new market, of this niche, uh, completely for us, uh, which is us trying to collaborate on creating boot camps uh, to help game development in Saudi Arabia, and at the same time, us trying to give a platform for every other gamer, because um, although gamers is a very vocal minority, uh, but there are huge numbers, they don't get their moment in the spotlight unless it's a very popular game. Uh, and this is and this is why we decided that if people are focusing on one, we're focusing on everyone else, uh, being that everyone else is using us anyways. And we're trying to create this uh, emotional relationship, which allows us to actually cross platform later on in the future. It's excellent what you're saying. And guys, please, if you have any questions for for I uh, and to how mobile you enter this space, please do uh, write them in the in the Q and A section. You've talked about the kind of approach to do it. Now, how do you see the, the whole industry going basically when it comes to the involvement of Saudi companies within the space? How everybody is jumping on that topic and how do you see it expanding, obviously, from the lens that you were probably one of the first brands who created a brand campaign when it comes to gaming and esports? How do you see the other brands going into the space right now and, and to which pace? Okay, well, I mean, um, uh, I have to say this disclaimer because, again, I happen to have some sort of skin into this game, so uh, take me as a bit biased to what we're trying to do. But from my own observation, I'll try to be as objective as possible because, again, uh, we were trying to go through the same sources of evaluating our research. Uh, our own observations is that the market is actually starting to notice that there is an opportunity or else you wouldn't have a full on government section uh, dedicated only for esports and nobody expected me being a gamer myself nobody expected something as a league of legend tournaments to have the biggest cash pool prize in the middle east to happen literally like three or four months ago this is something that happened overnight at least for me because this time last year everything was in planned uh, maybe it will happen. Nobody knows if this eSport thing is going to be. There's a lot of rumors happening around, oh, this brand is jumping in. Of course, telecoms happen to be uh, competing in this space head to head because they have the biggest uh, stake in this, being a service provider to these gamers. 
So it allows us to understand what those gamers need, and it allows us to understand as well how do we talk with them. Uh, we are not just a, uh, a snack that they can actually eat while playing. They have a, a relationship with us, uh, uh, be it in service or being in the loyalty that we're trying to create. And uh, what we're seeing from the other brands is that they break down to two categories, focused but quiet or completely scattered but very loud. Um, and we'll see the impact usually around every, every quarter or so. Uh, but we see that very small gradual footsteps leading into a big impact later on, creating that kind of ongoing relationship and creating that loyalty fan base. Because this is the best thing about gamers is that when you start small and you start creating that small community, when it grows with you, it really grows with you. And it starts to rely on you in terms of the kind of communication that you're giving, in terms of the, uh, uh, like the information that you're doing, and in the events as well. Uh, and this is like, uh, as, uh, I think this is something that we explored, you and me, uh, over now, not one, but two different tournaments and how the engagement keeps on adding on using the previous tournament as momentum. It's, it's good that you've mentioned the tournaments aspect. I mean, obviously, we see a lot of brands asking about how to create tournaments. We see a lot of tournaments happening here and there. In your eyes, from a brand standpoint, what do you expect to see when, when, when there's a branded tournament with Mobile? What are the parameters of success that you look for as a brand? Well, um, to be honest with you, way before, um, um, especially being just a follower, uh, I never knew the amount of information and detail that actually goes into them. Uh, I came from a boot camp where it's just about turning on a game and making a Twitch channel, and that's all you need for you to start a tournament. The whole infrastructure and content structure and the kind of behavior that goes throughout between the live streams and what to do when you're offline. So this kind of cohesive plan that the tournament is not just people competing together, it's a uh, maybe a week, two weeks, maybe a month worth of content of live streams, offline streams, engagements, giveaways. That kind of cohesive plan makes it uh, very easy uh, for us uh, as a brand to evaluate rather than just a hit or, uh, like a hit and run, which is most of the events that happened before. It used to be an activation on ground during some gamers day. We just have some kind of a small one-on-one -on -one tournament and that's it. There is no the kind of level of engagement that I attend and see online every now and then. So that kind of uh, detail and attention to detail, uh, where are you talking to the gamers? Where are you announcing uh, your tournament? Uh, I'm not going to be announcing my tournament in the streets if I can reach them all the way in Twitch or Discord. Uh, so knowing where to talk and how to talk uh, is going to be key in terms of understanding and evaluating is this going to be a tournament that I need to host, sponsor, or even create uh, on my own. Uh, one last question from my end before we jump into some interesting kind of tips on how to do it better. Uh, obviously, as a company like Mobile, it's, it's a big company that has a lot of stakeholders and a lot of layers as well for approvals. Um, yeah. What are the struggles that you guys face internally when you are able to kind of do stuff like this? Is there any, are there any struggles? Are there any kind of uh, extra efforts that you have to put internally for you guys to be able to make sure that these activities happen, which are a kind of left field space for the industry as a whole? Well, uh, I wouldn't call them struggles more than trying to identify yourself with something that is completely new. Uh, uh, and Mobile in Saudi Arabia has been there for 15 years, and we're very known to be an innovative in the market in terms of how we actually approach solutions. But at the same time, with that status, like the great Spider-Man quote, comes great responsibility in terms of that if I'm going to venture into something new, I don't want to venture into something that actually turns off to be a flop later on. I don't want to venture into an area that might not be something that gives me an advantage to the competition because at the end of the day, it is a competition in terms of who adopts what platform and how. So internally, we really did not face much of a problem in getting people convinced that esports is a thing more than trying to align momentum into pushing and to making esports as a complete uh, division. Because again, despite the fact that we here make it seem so big, uh, gaming is still a niche market considering everything else that a telecom company goes through. So it's more about we're going to start small or we started small and then slowly as the engagement and as the interaction increases, then you'll understand exactly what kind of market you're in. But at least that way, you're going to build up the kind of understanding and the kind of internal alignment that when the opportunity arises, 
everybody is going to jump on it. And I think that materialized recently uh, when uh, the Ministry of Communication started to uh, uh, to host uh, an event called Gamers Without Borders. I'm going to be uh, plugging that event now, which is basically a boot camp that teaches kids how to develop video games. And we saw this as an extremely uh, a great opportunity for mobile to be associated with that as we are the platform for the gamers. We are the platform that gives them a stage. And we are the platform that actually wants a new generation of gamers to come in, uh, being uh, the young ones and being the unknowns uh, who are uh, like very famous in their own regard, uh, the ones that we did feature content on uh, with you guys. Great, um, very insightful, very insightful tip, tips uh, for brands to go into the space. And this is exactly what we will be moving uh, to next uh, on how a brand, if, if a brand wants to go into that kind of space, what kind of, what kind of tips we can give them by the end of this, uh, this webinar. So first and foremost, I think, play by the player's rules, not your rules. It's, and, and this is a great example of how Pringles and Coke, the, the both videos that we have showed you, they are very genuine to the gaming community. They are really creating uh, elements that players want to play, uh, tournaments, events, activities, uh, similar to the world of uh, PUBG Mobile that Pringles created. Really simple, don't overcomplicate it, don't really try to create something that is new to that space. Stick by the rules that the players really adhere to and everything will be fine. Um, tip number two, I think here to what Mobile did, obviously, and what, what Vodafone example we showed you, work on an idea that is helping the gaming community at first. We have seen with the Mobile campaign, uh, bringing that voice uh, to the public, bringing those, uh, those gamers to the limelight, giving them something in return to what they have done to their country and to their communities. So whenever you want to work on an idea, try to work on something that is really helping the gaming community, because this is how the perception will be obviously reverted back to you in a positive sentiment. Another tip, link the initiative to your brand values. There's really always a fit. And we've seen how Mercedes obviously have done this. And I will take the example of Axe. Axe is a brand that's really building, uh, it, it got built on the essence of creating its mojo of being able to be seductive. And look how they used a gaming scenario and a gaming context to really fit that kind of uh, value that they always stand for. And this is very important. There's always a brand fit. And, and, and this leads me to the fourth tip which is also important, going into, a, going into gaming and esports can really change a brand perception. I mean, Shell did it. Shell, obviously, it's a big, bad energy company. And, you know, the Generation Z look at it as, you know, this is a fuel company that is not helping the world when it comes to the global warming and such. But obviously, going into that space, talking to that audience will be able to give you a trick or two to work on your perception towards a, a, a certain community. Tip number five, do not be intrusive, be insightful, be authentic. Look at Wendy's, really simple, straightforward. They didn't really overthought about how they want to do it. They really just understood the game and they really understood how the gamers played the game. And the gamers created the idea. And that's the strength of the, of the idea itself, similar to Alliance Serial. When we talk about EU and NA, if you go and talk to anyone right now, they don't understand what is this, why there is this rivalry. But obviously, the mere fact that Lion Bar, Lion Serial, obviously took the initiative to demonstrate that rivalry in a piece of content that they created gives you a lot of uh, hope that brands really want to be insightful and authentic in the way that they communicate to this type of audience. And last but not least, it's really simple. Speak to gamers where gamers are. We talk here about Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Twitch, Discord, and I know there's, there's, there will be questions where is Mixer, where there's a lot of live platforms. Here we chose the platforms, obviously, that uh, they are available and strong within the region. Um, I think the screen is, yeah, mixing, so it's good right now. So nonetheless, these are the six tips that we leave you with. Please uh, do type your questions in the Q&A, and I think we will be able to take those accordingly right now. So, Edward, to you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, so now it's time to go into the Q&A. Uh, I hope you guys found this uh, very interesting. Thank you very much, Luai, also, for your very insightful uh, testimony. Uh, I do see a lot, a lot of, uh, of interesting questions here. Uh, we'll try to answer uh, some of them live, most of them live. Um, and I'll redirect these to uh, you, Joe, or um, 
or do I? Um, okay, I, I was expecting this one, and this one is interesting indeed. Um, we talked a lot about the target audience, and we have a question. Uh, Joe, is gaming spreading among women in the region? Absolutely, absolutely. It's that dramatically growing. We, we've seen 70-30 and obviously this number is really growing to, uh, to the 40s as we speak. Uh, we see a lot of game streamers right now. We see a lot of esports organizations that are hiring game streamers, female game streamers, uh, on, on a continuous basis. It's becoming a norm. It's becoming not a trend. It's becoming something that is absolutely normal. We expect this to be happening more and more often and we expect we expect also brand to jump on this more and more often. There was a girl gamer event that happened in Dubai a couple of months back. And obviously when these kind of things will occur, the growth will happen. And obviously women will tap into the space more and more as we go. Great, thank you. Uh, I see several questions for Luai. Luai, are you still with us? Yep, I'm here. I'm just on mute because my kid is just running around me. <laughs> Yes, these are the joy of uh, confinement. So a first question for you, Luai. Um, with 5G taking gaming's experience to the next level, uh, how do you see the communication strategy shifting for mobile? Well, I mean, you just said it. Uh, 5G is more of an adoptive uh, technology. It's not an intrusive technology. So you're not really introducing more than you're trying to showcase the application of how 5G is actually improving every single aspect of what you already know. Um, uh, the audience right now are not as uh, illiterate as they were before. Everybody is tech savvy. Everybody understands 5G is the hype. Uh, it's all about the application. And uh, uh, like here at Mobile, we're studying all across the separate type of applications that are actually associated with 5G, with gaming being at its core because of latency. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, um, when it comes to speaking the language, if I know how to market 5G, I know exactly what is going to be setting me apart than everybody else. And I know exactly what is going to be the appeal or the plug when it comes to uh, gaming in general. Do I? But that's yeah. But that's but that's but that's all I can uh, like say at the moment. All right, and and a second question for you uh, from someone in the audience who's definitely uh, very knowledgeable about esports, and I think Joe, you will be able to jump in as well. Um, so it's as you know, gamers hold grudges and have a very long-lasting memory. This is very true. Um, in saying that, there have been several large tournaments that did not go according to plan in our region and has scared several esports enthusiasts, both players and viewers. Uh, in your opinion, have these tournament organizers in our region learned from and improved on these missteps in recent times? And if so, do you have any examples of recent tournaments that set the right example? Apart from your tournament, uh, Luai, which- Yeah, of course, because, yeah, because I'm gonna be like uh, uh, biased on this, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I totally agree when it comes to, yes, uh, they never forgive and they never forget. Um, when, I mean, when any tournament that I attend, either virtually or actually in person, and it goes bad, I make sure that I at least bad talk that tournament for the next two weeks. So I understand exactly what they're, I mean, where that's coming from. Um, but then again, because this is a market with both uh, leaders and followers, uh, you're going to find uh, certain events that are hosted and organized by companies that are about to make a profit and they treat it as an activation. And there are companies that treat it more like an actual event with uh, subscribers, with followers, with attendees and so on and so forth. Um, uh, what I noticed, uh, at least what we noticed uh, uh, at Mobile, is that the variety of the suppliers has definitely increased both locally and internationally. Uh, uh, more and more people are uh, targeting certain interactions, certain type of events that they actually want to be associated in. Uh, they're promoting their services. And of course, the track record of these companies, uh, before us as a brand get associated with anybody else, the track record of these companies and the events that they hosted helps a lot in terms of deciding this event is going to be good or not. Uh, we get a lot of really interesting proposals. And usually when we remember, oh, so this is the company that hosted that event, and I remember that event was not that good, uh, we automatically say, uh, no, thank you, and we move on to the next option. So brands need to be aware in terms of what kind of uh, track record they're looking at to avoid uh, creating that kind of stigma with the audience, because again, 
once yeah. you lose that audience, it's a very hard uh, path for you to win them back again. So definitely uh, 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 the organizers learned and the growth of the market is a big uh, segment of that. But of course, there's ups and downs uh, in that growth. I would just add, add a quick point on the, on the ice point here. It's very important for all tournament organizers to understand um, the, 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 the nuances of broadcast and how the nuances of broadcast work and how the live business work. And they need to really understand also as well that in order for us to have a very successful live, it's very important for us to understand, obviously, how the reaction of the crowd goes to the live, how they interact with the Twitch channels, how they interact with the registration process from putting your email to participate in a tournament at, and until you receive the prize pool. Um, it, it has to be a communication that happens at every single layer, from the moment that they participate up to the moment that they sign off from the tournament itself. And they need to have a very clear communication with the organizer and a very transparent tournament with the organizer that is available almost all the time. You're talking to kids who are 16, 17 year old. They don't understand how business works or how the business should be working for them. All what they want, obviously, is to have a very good play and they have a very good organizer as well to kind of uh, provide them with that space. So it's a very challenging space. And to your point, absolutely right. They will not forget if you fail. So the trick is really not to fail and to really keep improving as you go. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have really lots of interesting questions. So hopefully we'll, we'll answer most of them. Um, a quick one for you, Joe, um, an interesting one. It's, so Mobile is definitely a, a great uh, case. Um, however, not every company is Mobile uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, size and, and budget. So with clients being nowadays more budget conscious, uh, how, how, how such an operation like Mobile is scalable budget wise? I think this is the interesting thing and the beauty about the business that it is scalable. It is something that can vary from a very small budget to a very high budget. Uh, the scalability of this obviously happens uh, in the context of time and in the context, uh, in the context of the amount of content that you create. Uh, people get really, uh, you know, they think that doing something uh, as the mobile stuff or any other tournament or content is really a huge amount of money. It's really not. It's, you can really win uh, with small tactical initiatives and with really budget efficient uh, uh, cases. Doing a small gaming activity is really not a lot of money. But doing it right is obviously what is the importance uh, of it. You can reach it through, uh, you can reach gamers through uh, doing content throughout obviously branded uh, elements with streamers, throughout uh, obviously creating uh, uh, some ads, uh, sponsoring teams. There are a lot of avenues where you are able to really have quick gains without really going all in. Uh, and identifying also the community at hand is really important. So it's really not a lot, it's, it's really not a lot uh, of money, but it's smart money, basically. Uh, and, and the rebound question on this one is, on a project more mobile or on a typical project, what's your lead time uh, to, to create such, a, such an activation? Um, I mean, the lead time obviously to create something like, um, I mean, mobile is obviously a big case because it had a brand campaign. Uh, so there was a lot of strategy and there was a lot of uh, production of content that happened from a video standpoint up to a really talent standpoint up to a tournament. So we're talking about three months to do a program of that kind of specific size. Uh, but sometimes you can do stuff within a month. Um, the, the beauty about the industry, it's very agile. We are able to activate it very quickly. We were tasked to create a Fortnite tournament for mobile during COVID-19. So we have done this obviously within a couple of weeks while everybody is in their bedroom. Uh, and we were able to pull, pull something like this. Uh, and that's the beauty of the business that we are able to do it remotely and quickly and efficiently. Uh, with cost effective solutions that provide great, great ROIs. So, Based on the brand case, based on exactly what the budget are, we are able to sue eventually what we want to create. Great, thank you. So I see a lot of questions on, um, you know, what are these budget conscious solutions? Can you share the presentation? And so on. all of these, um, I, I suggest we, we take this offline afterwards with uh, you people interested. Uh, obviously, we could have made this webinar last uh, an hour more or two hours more. Uh, so we try to address things top line and give you relevant examples. But then 
for sure you may have questions relevant for your specific industries, your specific budgets. Uh, we would be very happy to take this offline with you and provide you with more insights uh, on specific game, on specific industries. Uh, to continue on with a couple more questions, probably. Um, so I see some very expert questions. Um, so we mentioned a lot uh, the platforms like uh, Twitch, uh, YouTube Live. Uh, and a bit of an expert question, but it's why didn't we uh, why didn't we mention Mixer here, Joe? I mean, there's there's around 20 live streaming platforms in the world. 2022, even right now, uh, the Chinese uh, platforms are dramatically increasing by the minute. Uh, we didn't mention Mixer because sadly Mixer isn't really didn't really pick up in this region. So it's just for presentation purposes. We have displayed Twitch, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live, which are the most prominent streaming platforms in the region. Uh, obviously by the numbers and by the platform itself. But Mixer globally is moving very aggressively by acquiring Ninja and, uh, and uh, I think Shroud as well, uh, joined, uh, joined Mixer. So it's something to watch for the future. For the ones who don't know, Mixer is a streaming platform that is owned by Microsoft. Okay, so I, I'll take two more questions. Um, and this one is also, uh, it's very important for, um, for, for any brand who want to enter this space, um, it's, it's about the publishers. And what are the challenges uh, we are facing as Webedia, but also as a, what challenge a, a brand would face to work with a publisher? So to work with Epic for Fortnite or to work with uh, Tencent uh, on PUBG, for example. I mean, publishers, uh, they have a lot of, uh, they have their, their intellectual property that they have created, the game itself which is their most important asset. So they are obviously, as creators of that intellectual property, they are very protective of that IP. Uh, they want to obviously hand that IP to the right brand first and to the right uh, partner as well to be able to operate this. So whenever we want to work with a publisher, there's a lot of, it's a hefty process, but it's a very important process for them to protect uh, their assets. So we have to discuss with them about the brand that we want to integrate within it. Uh, we want to discuss with them about the way that we want to create the content about it. And we want to discuss with them about the time and the scale of it when it comes to the production value. Because obviously, if you create something that is not very good, they will not allow you uh, to, to work with them, obviously, moving forward. So it's a very challenging business from our end because it's a trifactor. It's, it's, it's with us. As a, as, a, as a content creator and a producer of content and tournaments. It's with the publisher who have the game and the intellectual property. And it's with the brand also as well to be, to be able to kind of coordinate between these three in line to what the publisher wants to do is the challenge. But from a, again, from a publishing standpoint, if you are in line uh, with their strategy of the content that they want to create, if you are in line with their uh, guidelines and rules and regulations on how to activate their intellectual property, there is a way, there, there's always a way. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm, I'm looking at all the remaining questions to take a last one. Uh, lots of interesting questions, so sorry if we can't understand all of them. Again, very happy to take them offline uh, afterwards. Um, okay, a last question is, and it goes a bit beyond the, the, the mere scope of this presentation is, uh, so beyond communicating with gamers or changing a brand's perception, create an activation, uh, what are the other opportunities for investment in the gaming and esports industries, specifically in the region? Well, in the region, the investment right now lies into probably three areas. So the first area is, uh, eventually and by all means uh, the creation of games you have seen games like latin and arab and uh, a lot of games that have really local uh, presence and very strong local presence like rise of kingdoms uh, that are really heavily uh, heavily advertising their their games within the, the space uh, salatin al arab is a is an Ar is a chinese game that is owned by 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 locals uh, is one of the most played games in the region so investing in game creation is a space that a lot of people are going into the second one is obviously in, in esports and teams, similar to, uh, to, uh, to any other region. Obviously going and creating teams, buying teams, investing in sponsorship of the teams and the players and growing that kind of industry is, is an area that is going to grow eventually uh, within the next, uh, within the next uh, obviously probably three to five years, I would say, maybe less. 
the last area is the area of content creation and publications and publishing content when it comes to gaming. So obviously, uh, as the ecosystem we showed earlier, there's the game, there's the esports teams and the talents, and there's also, you know, the media. So if you look at right now, you see a couple of prominent areas like Saudi Gamer and uh, Millennium and a couple of you here and there. I think there will be a lot of room of improvement and a lot of room of growth when it comes to the potential of investing in these spaces, uh, investing in creating content and publishing content and covering also esports games and events and activities and even considered as well to create events. So I would say probably these three areas are the areas where investment opportunities lie within the region itself uh, for esports, for the esport and gaming industries. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I believe it's time to end this webinar. So big thanks to Joe, to Luai for attending all the very insightful information. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending. I hope you found this interesting. Maybe it sparked something, maybe it confirmed some of your intuitions. Again, we're very happy to, uh, to, to take this further with you offline, to share more data, to share the presentation, um, please do reach out uh, and we can continue this uh, with great pleasure. Uh, thanks again and have a great day and a great weekend ahead. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Safe.